Good morning or good afternoon or whatever it is, wherever you are. Uh, y'all, my name is Miles Wood Boyer, and, uh, and thank you so much for uh, tuning in. This is the, uh, the Photographic Collective podcast. Um, guys, this is episode number four, which is cool because that means that you're still in on the ground level of this thing. And if you are just listening in, uh, maybe for the first time, you should go back a few episodes and catch up because we are on episode number four talking about uh, storytelling. But we're kind of coming at this from a different perspective than I think a lot of artists or photography podcasts have. We're breaking down the different elements of good storytelling, um, everything from podcasts, or I'm sorry, from perspectives into you know dynamic changes in a story and character development. And, uh, and today we're going to talk about something that is really uh, special and sort of dear to my heart with one of my closest friends in this industry. We're going to talk a lot about the way that your story informs your ability to tell other people's stories. That's the thing that not enough people focus on. We're so quick as artists to sort of like take ourselves out of the storytelling. And, and, uh, and I have learned over the years from following along with this guy that that is uh, that that's a disservice. So, um, without me, you know, like waxing any more poetic, let me introduce uh, a good friend of mine and one of the most talented photographers in the world. Let's call it what it is, uh, Phil Porto. Thanks, uh, what's up, buddy? What up, man? How the frick are you, dude? I uh, man, I, I I'll be honest. The only thing that I was nervous about for this whole podcast was how to do an introduction of you justice. <laughs> I, I think you did. You know, there was some blushing there, you know, but compared to our text messages, you know, I don't think too much can make me blush outside of, you know, those. Well, hey, speaking of, I uh, listen, here's here's I was trying to figure out how to actually sum you up and like do a good job of introducing Phil Porto and what you mean to me. And uh, and so here's what I did today. I actually sent out a message to a few of our closest friends for them to tell everybody a little bit about Phil Porto. Buddy, I just sent those to you. I would love, can you can you start at Allison Conklin for me? Just yeah. read through what other people have to say about you. Oh, man. All right. That, oh, you guys. All right. So Allison says, Phil Porto has a killer sense of style, super creative and talented. Beyond all of that, he is courageous and kind and makes us all instantly cooler just being no, just knowing him. She's so sweet. I love that girl. She's freaking incredible. Um, then the homie John Branch for uh, Phil Porto is hands down the most giving, supportive person I've met. He has a unique ability to meet you where you are, but also push you to the next level. Alongside that anyone he influences, it's not only through giving, but through friendship. Hands down, someone you want in your corner as a life friend supporting you. Derek Fassbender. Uh, Phil Porto is the ultimate fighter in an age of people who make excuses for why they aren't slash can't be successful. Wow, man. <sighs> Stacy Moore from Fujifilm. Um, Phil Porto is one of those servants of humans that is always asking, what can I do for you? What can I do for you? The most enthusiastic, curious, generous soul I think I've ever had the pleasure to meet. Brian Minier, I've known Phil for a short time, but he's a beacon of light and positivity. And anyone with that amount of tattoos is my best friend by default. And then Paul Von Ryder, Phil is one of those people that's ready and willing to share anything he has. It can be knowledge, time, friendship. Heck, the guy would probably share his lunch with you if you even remotely looked snacky. <laughs> Not full on hungry, just slightly hungry. He has done this for me several times and never once has asked for anything in return. The other stuff, not the lunch thing. Honestly, he reminds me of that one teacher we all had in high school. You know, the one that actually gave a shit about you. <laughs> the one that wanted nothing more than to watch you succeed. The one that was hyped when you got a good grade. Phil is everyone's cheerleader, and you feel that within 30 seconds of knowing him. You got me. I, I haven't said that word in a long time. And Paul <laughs> got him. I slid it in there. You got hey, me. Guys, if, if you're listening to this podcast right now and you don't get this impression right now, Phil Porto is a giver, man. Like the, the reason that I wanted to have you in here right now, Phil, is because it's the, it's the time in my podcast, it's the time in my life 
where I need a Phil Porto in my corner. And, uh, and man, I'm blessed to have that. But I want other people to be able uh, to absorb what that means and, and yeah. what that means to your community. And so, guys, if you're listening to this and you don't grasp what just happened, um, you know, four or five of probably the most known photographers on earth uh, responded to a text message today in in a matter of seconds, eager to brag on what Phil Porto means to them. This guy's the glue that holds together so many relationships. And it would be a huge disservice to talking about storytelling without getting to know Phil better, uh, kind of through that lens. Like how how you became this, man. Um, so, I, okay, first, before we even go there, dude, what does it feel like to get bragged on like that? Because I'm jealous. Honestly, man, it's like, it's, it's humbling. You know, these are people that I really hold dear to my heart, um, you know, including you and people that I respect on multiple levels, you know, just thinking about it today, you know, as we were getting ready with this podcast, um, knowing that it has nothing to necessarily do with my status as a photographer that, you know, forces these people to say anything. Um, and, and knowing that I could put down the camera tomorrow and still have, you know, that love from these people. Um, and, and we'll talk more about it, but especially in the season that I'm at right now and, and things that we're kind of going through, um, it hits, you know, it hits, it, it's hard. Um, it, it makes it all kind of feel worth it. Dude, I love that. Okay, so that that's like the perfect segue. Way to tee me up. You make me look good at this, Porto. <laughs> um, so, so I mentioned earlier that that we've done the last three episodes um, have been on these ideas of storytelling. And and listen, actually, um, though we've done several other recordings right now, yours is the first one that's going to record as an interview that we're going to release what? as an interview. So you're sort of my very first guest that anybody gets exposure to here. Um, there it is, man. <laughs> I, so. I know I touched on all of that, um, but I, I really want to emphasize this concept and, and sort of elaborate with you on this concept of like understanding um, how your story or, or let me say it more personally, how my story affects yeah. my ability as a storyteller, right? So before we even like dive into your accolades and your photography, your process, your perspective, even your post-process stuff, I mean, give us like a high level on who you are and where you came from, not not as a photographer, but just as yeah. a person. Yeah, man. Um, so my journey's been a bit crazy. Um, you know, at the age of two, you know, I had um, me and my older brother were with, you know, my mom who was a single mom at the time. Dad wasn't really around much. Um, and my left eye started getting really red. So my mom took me to the doctor at first. They thought it was like pink eye, but then it started to kind of just get crazy worse. Um, and then they found out that I had what's called rhabdomyosarcoma. Um, and as I continued to, you know, see doctors throughout the years for other stuff, um, anytime they hear the fact that I had rhabdomyosarcoma, they're kind of like thrown back. Um, because they constantly remind me of how severe uh, and aggressive of a tumor that is. Um, so I went through a ton of chemotherapy and radiation um, a as a child um, to the point that they didn't really think that like I would be able to do much, you know, that like based off of the extent of what I'd have to go through that, you know, there was a chance that I would be a vegetable, um, you know, like unable to really read, write, walk, talk like a normal child would be able to. Um, and so since that age, I've actually had a cataract behind my left eye. Um, so I haven't been able to see, you know, since I was two years old out of two eyes. Um, so everything that I do photographically is like with this one guy right here. So I got to take care of him. Um, and so, you know, so, so we kind of grew up in New York city, you know, um, a, a love for, you know, all things art, you know, fell in love with music at an early age, started doing hip hop, you know, in, in my preteens through my teens. Uh, we then moved to Florida, um, where I kind of continued in that form as well as, you know, taking on sports. It was kind of always that battle between if I wanted to be an athlete or if I wanted to be, you know, an artist. Um, and then when I stopped growing at like five, five, it kind of made that decision for me. Uh, it was like, all right, bro, you're not Muggsy Bogues. It's not going to happen. Um, so I kind of continued in the art career. Um, I was in a, you know, a band for years, you know, that was what I always thought I would do for the rest of my life. Um, 
And then I wound up getting married uh, while I was engaged. Um, well, even before that, my wife was like, yo, listen, like, I'm super down with this. I'm happy that you're making money touring the world, whatever. Um, but I'm not the kind of girl that's going to sit home for 10 months out of the year while you like travel. So I had to make a decision between five sweaty dudes to wake up to every morning uh, or a hot wife. And so I chose my hot wife. And I and when you never put it that it. way. Yeah, right. You know, yeah. easiest so, decision ever. <laughs> so, so yeah, so we, we did that. Um, and then, you know, we, uh, we kind of struggled for a few years, you know, with our story, um, because based off of all the chemo and radiation that I had to go through, um, like it led to a lot of infertility, you know, because of the fact that they pretty much just had to blast me with radiation to, to save my life. Um, and so, so that was a hard thing, you know, like I came to a, a, a faith in Christ, you know, in my teenage years um, and, and kind of realized that this all was part of my journey for a reason. Um, and so, you know, but but when the infertility things started happening, you know, that was like, come on, what's going on, you know? Uh, and, and so I also started pursuing, you know, um, photography at that time, you know, this awesome couple that I worked with at Apple, uh, Leo and Brittany of Rad Red Creative, um, they were just like, hey, you know, uh, Brittany's sick. I need, you know, someone to photograph this event with me. Will you do it? Uh, and, and it was crazy because the whole story was like Leo used to come to our shows when I used to tour through um, the city that I then moved to. And so he was a kid that came to my concerts that I'm now working with and now shooting photos with. Um, and he was like, man, these photos came out great. Brittany's still sick. Will you shoot this wedding with me? I was like, sure. So I shot the wedding with him. Everything went well. Someone saw my photos, was like, hey, oh my gosh, why don't you shoot my wedding? It was actually my manager at Apple at the time. Before I could say, no, I'm not a wedding photographer, the words, I'll send you a contract tonight came out of my mouth. Uh, and it was downhill from there. I never had a contract. I Googled it real quick, created a contract, created you know something to send to her became a wedding photographer. Um, and so now years later, you know, we have a successful business that has had massive ups and downs. Um, but it's been an extremely awesome journey through the process. Um, we now have two boys that uh, we absolutely love and adore. Uh, one of them is named Miles. Don't let this guy fool you. He was not named after, uh, you know, abs over here. Uh, he Jared, <laughs> Jared, can we get a foghorn edited in in that moment, please? <laughs> So, so, so yeah, so Miles tells everybody that I named my son after him. It's this ongoing revenge for posting a YouTube video of him shirtless. Um, and so don't Google so, that, <laughs> Google it. Um, and so it's the one with Derek Fossbender, check it out. Um, and so, yeah, so, you know, fast forward, you know, we are now in another stage of, uh, some new health stuff and trying to kind of navigate that as a family, as a business owner and everything like that. And so when you started talking about, you know, storytelling and asking me, you know, if I would be part of this podcast, it kind of really hit me because I feel like you really have to accept and kind of come to terms with your story um, before you can truly tell the story of other people. Um, like, I feel like, um, someone's story uh, is going to have good parts, bad parts, ugly parts, um, sad parts, joy-filled parts. But without one of those, it's no longer really your story. And so I feel like it's a modified version of truth. And if you're willing to modify your version of truth, you'll be willing to modify everyone else's version of truth and their stories. Um, and I feel like you can't do that. I feel like you have to be able to tell every part of someone's story. If you're going to document their wedding, their event, their business, whatever it is, like you have to include all those parts or it's kind of just a portion of their story. A mic drop. You guys were like, <laughs> what? That was one question. And already that's better than the last three episodes. That's the reason for that is because it was just me speaking in the last three. Phil, that's, oh, dude. Uh, like, I have this list of questions in front of me, but now I'm swamped with all these other ones in my head. So, so your story, obviously, very, um, really very complex. 
You know, oh, like yeah. uh, this isn't like a typical Midwesterners, like, you know, picket fence and 2.5 children's story. Like you, <laughs> you, yeah. you've lived some stuff, man. Yeah. Yeah. And I actually forgot like in that, um, 10 years ago, I had a brain tumor as well. Um, and so I actually had to go through surgery where they had to cut through the right side of my head to get the tumor. And they actually had to cut my eardrum out completely. Um, so I had to learn how to walk and talk all over again and hear, uh, from one eardrum. So that was another thing was like, you know, giving your all to who you feel you're supposed to be. Um, because at that time that that happened based off of the fact that I can only hear from one side and see from one side, um, I was asked if I wanted to claim disability and be on disability for the rest of my life and just receive checks. Um, but I knew that like, that wasn't my journey. Like I knew that I couldn't settle for that. I knew that there's people that can't get up in the morning, you know, and that disability check should go to them. So yeah, the journey's definitely been crazy to say the least for sure. Gosh, man. I mean, uh, okay. So like, let's bring this into perspective aside from the, the way that this anybody with even like a remotely a heart that's listening to this is going to be juggling just the just the internal battles, right? The insecurities, the struggles, the, just all of the, the life stuff that you've been through, but like just on a, on a factual basis, yeah, you're a full-time wedding photographer or portrait photographer, studio photographer as well. I know, um, that can see out of one eye and hear out of the opposite ear. Yeah. Uh, Dude, I just want to say this, like, before we dig into this, um, one of the things that that I have grown to just be so uh, fascinated by with you is the fact that 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 isn't central to your story. Mm. It, it, it it informs clearly. It informs yeah. uh, you know your story, but that you've never, uh, at least with me, ever settled on that fact, and yet you're creating work that is you know world quality world recognized award winning work um you know at a at a pretty severe disadvantage really yeah. um okay so so i guess here's my question cuz now obviously that's just a statement me just being kind of in awe of you yeah. I, so here's here's a question all of these things that you've been through like these 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 battles and and we're going to get to some of the high points as well cuz you've you've been on top of some pretty remarkable mountains as well yeah all of these things that you've that you've kind of battled through, how does that how does that make you more empathetic to the people on the other side of your camera? Like, how does yeah. that affect your ability to tell their story? Yeah, um, honestly, I feel like one of the things that I really ha- have a hard time with in the industry, and I would love like anyone listening to see this, is that like when you become a photographer and you're documenting like weddings and stuff like that. Um, And you're like, I'm trying to figure out what kind of photographer I'm going to be. Like, these are the people's work that I like. And I'm like, no, that's not how you define what kind of photographer you're going to be is based off of whether you like Lucas Carinta or Ben Heish's preset better. Like that doesn't define you as a photographer, you know? So like, for instance, you know, you're talking about the empathy, like that, is what I want to be known for. You know, yesterday I was talking with a couple um, that I'm shooting their wedding and, you know, she brought it to my attention. She's like, Hey, I just want you to know um, that when we're taking photos, uh, he is, you know, deaf. And so he's going to be wearing an earpiece, you know, and like, you could tell that, you know, there was that little bit of self-consciousness, you know, with that, you know? Um, And, it allowed me to, in that moment, be like, Hey man, I want to share something with you. Like eight, you know, 10 years ago, I had a brain tumor. They completely cut out my right eardrum. I'm completely deaf in that ear, completely blind in this eye. So I understand, you know, having things that you can kind of feel self-conscious about. And I was like, so if we're in portrait time and, you know, I say something and you don't hear me or anything like that, feel free to let me know. And I was like, but if you say it on my right side, I'm not ignoring you. I just don't hear you either, you know? And and like, he laughed and the ice was broken, you know? And she was like, that really 
feels like a, a, a crazy connection that was just made. And I was like, well, good. I want him to know that, like, I understand that stuff. You know, I understand that feeling of like, man, you know, this isn't something that I'm super proud of, you know, visually, but it's still part of my journey. You know, like there, there's definitely times where I have to take a step back and realize that like, I may not get the creative photo that I thought I was going to try that day, but if it comes at the sacrifice of being able to tell another part of their story, it's more important. You know, first getting into the industry, you're like, I got to build my portfolio. You know, this is the kind of photo I need to take. And now I'm just like, okay, five minutes less of portrait time, but I'm documenting like mom and, you know, son having a real deep and intimate moment. Like, that's more important. I'm not going to rush him out of that to take a cool portrait that they may or may not love, but the industry will, you know? So it helps you kind of see what's really, really important. You know, it's hard for me not to get choked up, you know, during a father, uh, I mean, a, 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 a mother son dance, you know, like, because when I was growing up, my mom was the only one that was in my corner, you know, like, so my mom sacrificed everything. She, she left her, her pursuits of being a lawyer, you know, so that she could be next to her son who was unsure what was going to happen, you know, like at the end of the day. And so, so those kind of moments hold a lot more weight to me than a couple looking dope on the side of a mountain, you know? Um, So it kind of just changes my perspective to, to, to really, realize that it's not about us. Like, I can't say that enough in any podcast that I'm in. Like, if if you're a photographer, because you want the accolades and the praise and all that stuff, then definitely don't shoot weddings or anything that matters to a couple or, or a client. Like, don't do them the, the disservice, because it's not about us. It's about them. Dude. Okay. So, uh, so, so I, I want to ask then, along that exact same thought track, because you're able to relate to people in this sort of remarkable way, uh, because you don't hide behind the parts of you that are just unique or the things that you've fought through. I mean, not that you could realistically, right? Like, you know, guys, if you're, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can see, uh, you know, like Phil Porto has the, the physical scars of, yeah. uh, of, you know, a, a hard life. And, um, so I, I want to know then, you know, you you were a part of this with me. Actually, you really encouraged me through this. It was a, a couple of years ago. I really kind of went on this war path, right? Of like kind of attacking the, uh, what. remember I, I would call it like the Labradoodle Society, yeah, right? Yeah. Like the broad, the broad brim hats and the, the, the vanilla latte toting wedding photographers <laughs> where everything just felt very surface level. Yeah. Um, and what's interesting though, is I, what I really needed to be doing was being encouraged through that. And you did that for me was to say like, Hey, it doesn't do any good to ask these people to be more real. It, it, it's does a, a lot more of a service to just show them what real looks like. Yeah. And I think you do that on a, on a daily basis, yeah. but how do you take, how do you take that with you into a situation, um, you know, all the insecurities that come into that, into a situation where a couple doesn't have a disability or doesn't have, yeah. right? You are the five, five heavily tattooed guy with, right? Like, how does that inform your storytelling in, in, you know, maybe just a more standard situation? Yeah. Um, so, so, so I think what, what, what happens is for, for a while I wrestled with, the fact that like everything I put my hands to, I wanted to be the best at, you know? Um, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, there, there's nothing wrong with working in excellence. Um, but you know, my, 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 you know, pastor and whatnot kind of helped me realize that like I was chasing the notoriety, you know, and, and the praise of man, you know, and, and at times that can still trickle up and I have to like put it in a headlock and be like, calm the freak down. Um, but when you're able to like no longer do that, you know, which is why um, when we were having those kind of talks about like, just be the realness that you want in the industry and people will see it and see the authenticity and it'll start to make an impact um, is because so many trends come and go in the industry, you know, and, and people jump on that because it's cool right then and there, you know, like there, there was a time where I would post a phone, a photo about a real moment. And like, 
instantly it would get like a choo-choo, you know, on, on look when looks like film was like the biggest thing that you could chase after, you know? And like, now you post a real moment and everyone's just like, where's the cool thing, you know? And so like, that's going to come and go. But what I realized is for my clients, they just want the real, you know, they don't care about how many other photographers think you're dope. Like they just don't, you know? And so when I realized that me being me, and, and, and connecting with my couples and being sincere and loving them, you know, exactly the way that they are, you know, like not having an idea of who they need to be. Like so many people are like, how do you get all these cool couples? I'm like, I don't search for cool couples. I search for authentic people that I can work with. You know, like there are some really quote unquote cool people that I've passed up their weddings because I wasn't vibing with them because they weren't real and sincere. And so I've always tried to go by, you know, like you can see my man big up there, like real recognizes real, you know? And so I've always just tried to be real, try to be sincere, try to be authentic. Um, and, 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 that comes with the good and the bad of me sometimes. Um, and, and I take the good and the bad of my couples as well. Um, and we work through those things to, to build a relationship that actually matters. You know, I don't see them as a transaction. I don't see them as another date on my books. Um, I see them as real people that want someone real to spend some real time with them. And that's how I try to approach the business. And that's how it's been successful. Like if you look at my first submission to range find your top 30. A lot of it was like cool photos. Um, and then I just realized like, I'm just posting photos that like, I want people to think are cool and like award me as a photographer for that. But yet my favorite photos are the mom and dad weeping because dad's sick, you know, or like, uh, a, a guy who showed up at the wedding that wasn't supposed to be there. And you just see the bride in the background, like weeping as her husband's weeping and holding the friend that wasn't supposed to be there. You know, like next time I submitted to Rangefinder, it was mostly emotional tearjerker kind of photos, you know, because that's what I care about. So just finding that transparency to just be myself has allowed me to work with people that just want someone to be real, not to be cool. Dude. So I, I just want to like re I, I want to slow down and let that sink because I, I think one of the most powerful things about your work is, um, is the fact, you know, and, and I will say this about a lot of photographers that, that, you know, either we're friends with, or we both look up to a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would say the same thing about Jonas, yeah. uh, you know, like you allow the scars and the pain and the heartbreak that come, um, you know, before or or maybe sort of like are necessary ingredients to the joy into yeah. those photos, but not in this like dark way. It, you have this beautiful way of celebrating humanity, and uh, and sort of all of the the realms of it. And so that was that was actually the, like the next thing that I had written down to talk to you about was this idea of like. How, do, how does that work? What does it look like for a photographer to take their bias and their ignorance and their life experience to take the, the scars and the heartbreak, but also the accomplishments and the awards? What does that feel like to take that into a moment with you and allow every piece of who you are to integrate into the story that you're telling? Yeah. Um, so, so I think it's like making sure you realize that every movie that has ever been worth watching, you know, like has a pain moment, you know, like every movie, whether you're watching something as predictable as like an action comic book movie, you know, or you're watching something as chick flick as the notebook, or you're watching something as, you know, heart piercing as the pursuit of happiness. Like every movie has a sense of brokenness and they don't eliminate that from the story to say, but we want this story to be joyful. Like there, there's, you know, the, the saying that joy wouldn't feel so good if it wasn't for pain. Mm, and so- I like that. Yeah, it's and it's so true. It's like I can celebrate and look at my boys 
and rejoice and have such a hard time that straight up, I don't care if this makes me look like a pansy. Anytime I travel for a wedding, I weep at the airport because spending time away from my boys is the hardest thing in the world. Like my wife understands it, you know, like her and I, you know, understand me traveling. My, my boys don't really understand it. You know, like hearing the words like, daddy, I don't want you to go there anymore. Like that's hard, you know? And so the, the, the thought of not seeing my boys, it, it, it brings that weeping. Um, but when I look at my boys and I'm filled with such joy, it's the joy because I love them, but also the joy of the fact that based off my medical history, I never thought that I would have boys to walk hand in hand with at Disney, you know, like that was something that I would witness and cry while with my wife at Disney, because I never thought that I would see that day. And so that pain of, you know, not being able to, to now be able to, that joy is that much more beautiful. So being able to document every single part and using every single part of my journey in my storytelling allows me to say, this was a painful time, but there was beauty in it as well. Like they're, they're going to be able to look back and see the beauty. So, so, and, and, and not knowing if what you're looking at is joyous or beautiful and not, or, or, or painful is also a huge perspective that you have to go in with an unbiased. So for example, uh, when my wife was shooting with me, we shot a wedding of this really, really sweet girl named Julia. Um, and we shot her wedding and her and her dad just had this really, really sweet connection. Like it was absolutely beautiful. Um, and it was different than any other like dad and daughter that I had seen. Like there's been some beautiful ones, but this one was just like, you can tell that she was his world, you know? And so for some reason, I, I seriously feel like I shot in machine gun mode. Um, and this was when I had an XT2, so it wasn't even that fast of machine yeah. gun. Um, but I was just taking photo after photo after photo of the dad and daughter, you know, during the first dance, you know, their, 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 their uh, father-daughter dance. And typically when I call through, you know, it's like, all right, I got like eight of those. That's good. Yeah. But I was just like calling every single one. And I edited like a ridiculous amount. I think there was probably like, 30 to 40, like just photos of her and her dad in their short dance. Wow, okay. um, about, we delivered the collection very quickly. Um, I get an email about three days after um, I deliver the collection. And it said, don't know word for word, but Phil, thank you so much for these photos, especially the ones of me and my dad. None of us knew it, even him, but he had some unknown medical conditions that while we were on our honeymoon, he passed. And the last time that I ever saw my dad was at that reception. And now these photos mean even more to me than I ever thought they could. And so going into it and not making it about you where you go, I really don't need to take like, yeah, this is cute that she's dancing with her dad, but it's not that epic of a photo, you know, and putting your camera down, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know how a beautiful moment could turn into a tragic moment or a tragic moment can turn into a beautiful moment. So you just need to be there as a servant to those couples and love them well and document every part of their story because it's going to have more of an impact than you ever know. So I know that even the hard things in my story, the Lord has used to then either bring something beautiful either to my life or something transformative to someone else's life that's going through a hard time. So how can I hide those parts of my journey if it could do something good for somebody else? So that's why I see it that way, that every part of the journey is necessary. Dude, so powerful, Phil. I, I actually have a... Uh... I've got a really similar story. I'll, I'll tell you at some yeah. point that I've, I feel like I've said on so many different podcast recordings right now, I'm, I won't bore everybody at this point, but, um, but it, it, the moment for me, when, when something like that happened, I had a groom that, um, was paralyzed on the way back from mm. honeymoon. And, uh, and so, um, the reaction that I got from him was that, that he'll never forget the weight 
of the, her of his wife hanging from his neck because he would ne- he'll never feel that again. Mm. But you're right. It's it's fascinating the way um the way you know on the surface so many storytellers try and um yeah I actually spoke about this in the last episode try and prescribe the story. They try and they try and script yeah. it in their head and say like okay I want to be, I want to be here. And then 15 minutes later, I want to be there and the sunlight will be great here. Yeah. And you know what? There's nothing wrong with that. That's actually a really, a really beautiful way to uh, inform yourself and get yourself ready to make your best work. But I think the, the, the thing that you just said is that you can't let a plan get in the way of the story. Yeah. Um, you, you've got to be willing to just let the story go. And, yeah. and, uh, and, and that's what, you know, that's what makes us different. And, you know, I, I think I've probably said this to you before, but that's what makes us different than authors. Yeah. Right. The, the difference is that, um, we're, we're more like, we're more like painters than we are authors. We're, we're letting the canvas tell us where to go next. Yeah. And, uh, and so dude, I, I okay. I love that. So from your perspective, then give us like, I want like a, a single sentence to, to Phil Porto, and uh, next I want to move into a little bit of us talking about community and your yeah. team and, and what all of that means to you. But just to fill, just, just to fill with a camera, what makes a good story? Yeah. Um, so I think what makes a good story is, first, the storyteller being present. You know, like I've seen so many times where I'm working – along somebody and they're physically there but they're not like it's just a job you know it's just like we clocked in we'll take the photos that we typically take and that's the problem is like like you said scripting things you know th- this isn't a, a a a movie where you know exactly everything that's going to happen you know the basis of you know how a wedding day is going to go and stuff like that Um, But it's like improv, you know, that there's characters, you know, that certain things are going to happen, but a small thing can completely change it and you have to be ready and flexible and willing. So I think for a good storyteller, you really have to just be fully present and you have to truly shoot with your heart. Like you, you, you have to really care about what you're doing. Like so many people that are like, oh, I'm going to be the next so-and-so he makes 200 K a year. Well, if that's your motive, get the frick out. Like, <laughs> like, I don't, I don't again, want you in the again, industry again for the people in the back though. So. Yeah. Like peace out. Like don't screw these couples over. Like, because you're going to see them as a dollar sign. You're going to treat them like a dollar sign and their photos are going to look like that. As opposed to someone who says, I want to shoot couples, clients who I can truly support and celebrate. Like I celebrate my couples. Like the best thing for me is not a couple saying, Hey, Phil, this is the coolest photo. It's going to get published. Like my favorite thing is I just got a text message from a couple that I shot this weekend. He went to the hotel that night after the wedding, we had already been done. We peaced out. We're at our hotel. He texts me at 12 AM on like the night of his wedding saying, thank you and your crew so much. Our day wouldn't have been the same without you. Like he didn't even wait to the next day to hit me back. He told me that already before I left the reception. The next day I woke up to another text from him saying, I just want to reiterate how appreciative we are. Like, let's get together soon. Let's get some whiskey together. Like these are people that are in my life, like years after, you know? And so That comes from me being able to tell their story because I cared enough about them to get to know them. Like when I do a meeting with a client that reaches out for me to shoot their wedding, we don't talk about the wedding till about 30, 40 minutes into the conversation. I want to know where they're from, how they cross paths, who made the first freaking move? Like, were, was he or she hard to get? Like, what do you like to do now? You know, like, what's your life going to be like? And then we can talk about the wedding. And so that's a real storyteller to me is you don't just pick up, even, even an author, even an author, an author doesn't just pick up a pen, yeah. have a story in mind. They know the characters 
first and foremost before they ever start telling the story because they need to know who that main character is, what makes that main character tick, what makes that main character celebrate, and how that correlates with the other characters in the story. And so that for me is what makes a good storyteller as a photographer. Okay, so you've you've done something though really critical, uh, I, I think that you just touched on, um, in the sense that you've you've allowed then your brand experience, your client experience, to be really centric to the people that are hiring you. Yeah, um, and then you've allowed, and like, correct me if I'm wrong here, but then you've allowed, and in this order, then you've allowed your stylistic approaches and your stylistic decisions, your lighting, your post process, your color. Yeah. All of that stuff comes second to Correct. the relationship with the couple. Am I right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Our our whole brand is real moments meets the fine art. Like we want the couple to say, "Holy frick, I look hot!" Like I could be on a magazine cover, but we want that to come after they say. I remember exactly how we felt in that moment. This wasn't Phil telling us to laugh. This was sincere laughter. I remember what you said to me that made me weep in that moment. Like, so the only way to do that is to connect with the couple and build that relationship. And once we have that relationship, then we can do the stylistic stuff. Like that, that comes secondary, you know, like that, that, that's just easy. Um, but the connection is the hard work. The, the actual connection is where the hard work comes in. I, I remember um, I went to a workshop early in my career and it was the worst and best experience for me. So it was the worst in the fact that like, it wasn't a good experience and everyone asked for their money back. Um, but it was the best experience because the photographer, he was well, very, very, very well known at the time, making tons and tons of money. Um, but he said something in his meeting where he was like, no, I don't meet clients. Like they give me their deposit. I show up to the wedding and I shoot the wedding. And I was just like, that's exactly the opposite way that I'm going to run my business. I'm going to do everything to get to know the client. I talk to clients for 30, 40 minutes, whether they book me or not. Like I don't take a deposit until I've gotten to know the couple and we both think it's the right fit. There's couples that we have talked about and they'll be like, hey, we love everything. Da 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 da. We're kind of looking for this too. And I'm like, actually, we don't do that but my friends do. And I would love to refer you to them because I think that they'd be the perfect fit. Because at the end of the day, if I can't tell their story exactly the way that they dreamed it, I don't take their money. Like that's not going to happen. So, so yeah, that totally forms everything. And then once the couple like has that relationship, they trust me, you know, like I'll start posing them. They know that the rest is, you know, going to be in the bag. Okay. So, Everything that you just summed up, everything that you just said, and really everything that you've said from the from the get go has really led to this, this sort of love for relationship. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, anybody that, that knows me very well has heard me say this a number of times as well, that the camera for me is it's like a driver. Yeah, right. It, it, it's just it's a tool that that allows me to have access to people's lives that without it, I would not. Um, and, and I think that's probably one of the reasons that you and I you kind of bonded early on is just yeah. that, that feeling of community. So you're well aware of this. We've, we've had these conversations anyway, but yeah. you're also a, a big part of the community that I'm really trying to sort of like shape and guide and, yeah. um, and, and be a part of myself. Right. But tell us a little bit about about your 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 team, your love for teaching, the community that you're a part of. Um, I know we're talking about story, but it, it seems to me like this is all a really integral part of yeah. of how you do work for your clients. Yeah, and, and, and for sure, like I, it all goes kind of hand in hand, you know. So when I first got into the industry, um, there is a very thrown around statement community over competition. Um, and, and after like a few weeks of being in the industry, I was like, this is crap. Like y'all, y'all are straight backbiting each other. Every conversation you're in, you were hanging out with that person on Friday. And now on Sunday, you're telling me this, that, whatever about them yeah. that I don't want to hear, you know? So it was just like, at first I was just like, man, I just, I, I don't want to be in this group of like photographers, you know, I, I just going to do my own thing. Um, and then I realized that there were sincere, legit people out there, you know, and I was like, okay, 
I'm going to, like I had told you, like, I'm just going to be the change that I want to see in the industry and I'm going to love people well. Um, and so teaching has always been a passion of mine. And so the first person that I kind of took under my wing, um, I taught him everything I knew, uh, and kind of bit me in the back, um, kind of took everything that I taught, kind of screwed me over, lost thousands and thousands of dollars, um, on the person. Um, and, and it was kind of a bitter, you know, experience. Um, but I realized that like, that doesn't trump my call to teach, you know, so I continued, you know, and I, you know, formed this team and with my team, the best part about it is that like, as I'm pouring out to them, um, I'm realizing that I'm getting filled up just as much. Like I have learned so much from my team, like how to be a leader, how, to, to make things better when I drop the ball as a leader, um, how to communicate with different personality types um, and, and all that stuff and being able to use it in, in, in my journey as a storyteller and, and realizing, you know, how important it is to know the things that make someone feel like they're on top of the world and knowing that you could talk to the same person, I mean, a, a different person the same way and make them feel like they're at the bottom of the barrel, you know, and learning like how to, how to switch that in yourself. And so teaching has always kind of been my thing. And so with each team member that I've had, it's been awesome because I had to realize that I was teaching them the why Phil Porto did things because we all talk about, you know, like our, our why. Um, but at first I only taught them the how, and that was such a problem because they're posing couples the way that I would, but I wasn't getting the emotion that I was it, it, like used to getting. I wasn't getting that relationship. And so I kind of toned it back and started teaching our team the, ha the, the why of why I do things, the, the, the main important pieces. And then realizing that I had to not expect them to be many Phil Portos, but that they were going to be Angela's that learned from Phil Porto. They were going to be John Branch that learned from Phil Porto. They were going to be Brandon. They were going to be Claire, Frankie, Eric, you know, like the team was going to be them. They were going to be Jen. Um, and so that made it so much more beautiful because I gave them the skills that they needed, but empowered them to be their personality and see how they're able to then tell stories. So when you look at the collection, artistically, everything looks the same. But when you look at full collections, you see the little variances in each person's like story and style, because that's how they're shooting from. So storytelling for me has been, you know, changed by my team, it's been changed by my community. Um, because, you know, just even in the text group that we have, you know, like, I, I can feel at the top of, of my game one day, you know, and then the next day just feel completely out of it, you know, and have someone go, Phil, like you on your worst day is still better. Like that, than, than most photographers they could have hired, like chill out. You're good. You know, like <laughs> having I that, I've, I think I have written you that sentence before. You, exactly. <laughs> which is why I said it like, so, so having that encouragement and that true community and like, it's, it, it, it's one thing to get, you know, accolades or encouragement from like people that are just see you as a photographer, but knowing that that group sees me as a lot more than that. Like we talked earlier, you know, I know it's sincere. I know it's legit. And, and, and I know that I can use that and it snaps me right back into where I need to be, you know, and it gets me right back into that storytelling, you know, mode, but also being able to like be legit and honest with my community allows me to be legit and honest with how I'm handling the journey that I'm, that I'm on, you know, so many times I feel like we don't have someone that we can be completely open and transparent with. And so we wrestle with that and we take that into our work, you know, that wrestle that, yeah. that toggling back and forth. Um, but knowing I can like hit up miles and be like, dude, this is so, some medical news I just got right now. And I'm terrified, you know, being able to like have that sincere conversation allows me to walk through that with you so that I don't have to walk through that by myself on that Saturday when I'm shooting that wedding, you know? Yeah. Um, so, so, so it's been huge. And honestly, like it makes me love the industry even more. 
you know, like it makes me love what I do more because there's times where burnout's a thing. You know, there's times where I don't want to reply to an email. There's times where I don't want to have to like get on a flight. There's this, that, whatever. But then just the other day, okay, so if you guys are watching this, you probably have heard of John Branch for photography. Um, incredible guy, you know. Um, and so John was a part of my team for like four years. He, you know, blessed me with the opportunity to mentor him. Like, I don't see it the other way around. Like, even though he says the other, like, it was a blessing for me to, to, to mentor him. Um, so we're up in Philadelphia the other day. Um, and I go and we're grabbing some coffee and we see this guy just shooting with a GFX. And we're like, what? This guy's shooting with a GFX in a random coffee shop. Um, so he comes on, like walks on to the area that we're at. And I'm like, Hey, you shooting GFX? He's like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I was like, what, what lens? He's like, oh, the 80. I was like, man, it's gorgeous. You know, we start talking and he's like, yeah, yeah, I'm so-and-so. I was like, hey, I'm Phil. And he, my team member's like, I'm Eric. And then comes to John, he goes, and you're John Branch Four. Like he knew John, you know? And he was like, for me, like that meant the world to me. Like he had no clue who the freak I was, you know? And John's like, no, this is my mentor. He didn't give a crap. <laughs> like yeah. it was hilarious. But like that filled me up. Like I went into that next wedding feeling so joyous and, and, and so happy because for me, it's not about my cup getting filled up by this industry. It's about me pouring out. But moments like that, it comes back, you know, like it fills me back up to then be able to pour out to my couples and to pour out to my friends. Um, and so seeing John's success and seeing your success, seeing Paul kill it, you know, seeing, you know, Brian and Allison and just seeing everybody, seeing Derek be like, hey, Fuji posted 55 of my 33 millimeter photos, you yeah, know, we'll like get to, we'll get to that. Yeah, you know, like, so seeing that, like that stuff restores me and empowers me to continue being a storyteller yeah. because like what we do matters at times. It may not feel like it, but those kind of moments and having a community that empowers you reminds you of how blessed we are to be able to do what we do. Dude. I mean, way to, way to close that up with just like a beautiful bow. Oof. Uh, I need more coffee. Dude, this is good. Okay, so I know you, I know you've mentioned a few times. I don't want to put you on the spot here. I, I know you've mentioned a few times that you're you've, you you know you're going through some some more medical stuff right now. Yeah. What's what's coming up for you next, personally, professionally? Yeah. Um, you know what's what's on like what's on your plate for your story right now? Yeah. Um, so honestly, right now there's a few question marks uh, when it comes to my story. Um, so. I, uh, I was having some like issues with like, you know, breathing and stuff like that. And like my heart, which was weird because like, I've been nonstop running, you know, me and my team member, member Brandon, you know, we've been really trying to just go at it, um, for the last few months. And so I went to the doctor and so had some tests, they found some anemia in my blood that they're not sure why that's there. Um, they found some risk of heart, heart disease, um, so I just ran some tests and they're going to give me the results next week. So that's one question mark. Um, yeah. in, in the midst of all that unknown, um, I was going for my brain tumor follow-up, my 10 year follow-up. And I remember Allison texting like, Hey, don't you have the appointment today? And I was like, yeah, this is going to be the good one though. Like I, I know it's continued to shrink. Da, 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 da. This is like the least of my worries. Um, little did I know it was the biggest uh, of the worries that would come. So the brain tumor was continuing to shrink. Um, but the doctor found because it was an MRI of the back of my head where that tumor was, mm -hmm. but he noticed from where he does a lot of surgeries, a, a, a tumor that's behind my left eye. Um, and so that's where his worry and concern came in. Um, so he was pretty much saying that like, there's no way to find out if it's cancer or not without doing a biopsy. Um, so, so, uh, he, he's, he's hoping that it's benign and that like, it'll just be done and we can blast it with radiation as soon as possible so that it doesn't transfer over to the right eye. Cause mm -hmm. if it's benign, the kind of tumor that it is can travel to the other eye and then that could cause some dangers of blindness. Mm -hmm. Um, so, 
So that, that's what he's hoping. Um, but his other concern is that it's in a very similar spot to where the cancer was when I was two. Um, so he's hoping that it's not a reoccurrence of the very aggressive rhabdomyosarcoma. Yeah. Um, so on December 14th, I'll go in for surgery. Um, and you know, the, they'll, they'll get a piece of the tumor to test what it is. Um, with that, um, there are a lot of like risks of where they have to go in through, um, paralysis, you know, uh, uh, of the eye and that side of my face. Um, it's also very close to an area of the brain that can cause seizures. Um, so, so those are all the like big things. And, and obviously, you know, with a surgery like that, they kind of walk you through, you know, worst case scenarios of like, of course, something cutting wrong and, you know, causing, <clears throat> you know, something even worse as death, you know, like, so, um, but with the surgery, if everything goes smoothly and well, um, they said, I won't be able to do anything, especially like in natural light workings, being on my feet for up to two months. Um, so yeah, so, so, so that's hard, you know, um, luckily, you know, I have the team that <sighs> try not to get choked up. Um, luckily yeah. I have this team that, you know, that they've, as soon as I, broke the news, you know, they were like, let us know, you know, like, what do we have to do? We'll take on whatever, you know, like pay us less so that, you know, we can, we can cover you. Um, and, and, and the couples that are affected immediately, I let them know. And they were super sweet. You know, they were like, you don't worry about us. You worry about you right now in this time. Um, so I'm thankful that I have the relationship with those kind of couples, um, that we spoke about earlier, cause they don't see me as, you know, a, button pusher or a servant on their wedding day, you know, yeah. um, they, 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 they were very compassionate. Um, so once we get the biopsy results, we'll kind of then decide, you know, if it's not cancer, um, I can get right back to work after those two months, um, and go right back to it. Um, if it is, then I'll have to start chemo and radiation immediately. And then it'll kind of be a long journey, um, that, that I'll be out of the game. Um, so so just trying to work hard in the meantime, um, spend time with my wife and kids as much as I can. Um, you know, I have some people asking for the YouTube content to get back up, you know, and that's pretty much why it's been gone is because of all the like medical stuff that happened with me right after my son was dealing with medical stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so, so right now just trying to do as much as I can, you know, um, while also not taking on so much that it robs my family of this time, uh, before I have to go through this. Um, so, so yeah, so that's where all the question marks are right now, you know, so I'm just trying to work hard, make, you know, the money that I need to, you know, for those two months that I'll be, you know, out of work, um, and, and kind of just continue to trust the Lord, you know, which has been a little hard, you know, in this season. Um, but luckily he's, gracious and faithful, even when I'm not. Um, so just using the support that I have of my wife and my close friends, uh, to kind of just press through and realize that this is another part of my story. And if I come out on the other side, I'll use it to continue to shape how I storytell. Dude. Um, seriously, I want to let that resonate. Thank you, uh, for, for how open you just were. Um, because guys that, that you guys that are listening to this or watching this, I think, I think what you don't grasp frequently don't grasp is the fact that the photographers, just the people in your life that you probably most aspire to be like, um, often they, they feel really isolated. Um, we, we've spoken about this a lot is there's this sort of gap in the photo industry right now where, You've got, you know, 10 million people clawing at the bottom, but, but the people that they're all aspiring to get to are really lonely at the top. Yeah. And, um, and so I mentioned early on, Phil, that you're, you're like this glue, you, you connect so many people, uh, in this industry and you're, you're the, you, you are the friend to so many of us. And so dude, knowing that you're going through this is, it, it's really hard, I think on all of us, but more than that, um, I'm really honored to be able to expose 
your story and uh, and to be able to ask you know you guys that are listening to this to to do something about it um whether that is as simple as um as you know prayer for for Phil and his family or if it's something more tangible like taking the time to send a dm that just says like hey dude your story matters back because um, you know, I, I know I can speak for all of us, Phil, in in kind of our our little squad. Um, dude, every single one of us is uh, is not just hopeful and prayerful for what what comes out of things in in December, but already mm. eager for ways that we can help fill the void and the gap. So, yeah, um, dude, I just love you a lot. Thank you for the time that you've put in to this today. Um, that's the perfect way to wrap this thing yeah. is, is to tell people, to be able to say to people, if you want to be a better storyteller, live a better story. Yeah. <clears throat> um, you know, and you don't have to be the hero in your own story. In fact, actually, yeah. maybe that's never going to be your role. Maybe, maybe your job is, is to always sit alongside the hero or to sit beside the hero or behind or, or whatever. Um, so Phil, thank you for that, dude. What's a, what's a good way for people to, to connect with you, to support you. Everybody always says like, Oh, hit me in the DM, but (laughs) come on, really? Like, yeah. What, what is the best way for people to find you and, and, uh, and, and support you through the next several months and, and just connect with you artistically? Yeah. Um, so, you know, following on the Instagram at underscore Phil Porto underscore, um, honestly, subscribing to the YouTube channel will be huge. I'm going to try and put out as much content as I can between now and then. Um, John was actually really encouraging uh, on our last hangout to kind of push, push that, you know, like, and try to get to a point that the YouTube can financially help sustain in that time time that I'm, you know, MIA, um, you know, and, and prayer is huge, you know, um, I, I, I can't say enough about, you know, the encouragements that I've gotten in our group, you know, I, I think people don't realize that sincere words go a long way, you know, I'm never the kind of person that's like, oh, well, here's my GoFundMe, you know, like, that's not, you know, like, I, I'm the kind of guy that's like, you were there for me, you know, I, that that meant the world to me. Um, and so as soon as I sent the the text to the group and just seeing how everyone's responses were so sincere and so, you know, like compassionate, you know, that, that means the world to me, that's fuel for me and my family. Um, and, and just, you know, just that, the, the, that kind of support, you know, being able to, um, know that people are behind me is, fuel to keep fighting, you know, like there, there's times that I feel really, really drained, you know, and then an encouragement or a prayer or just someone checking on, you know, how I'm handling things, uh, gives me enough to, to, to make it through that day, you know, and, and makes it enough to where I can focus on that instead of focusing on all the questions that I have. Um, so, so yeah, that's the best way. Follow the Instagram, follow the YouTube channel, hit me up. Like I'm not the kind of person that's going to leave your DM on red for like four years. Um, I, I, I will check it out. Um, so yeah, thank you guys. I appreciate it. Dude. Super cool. Okay. So last, last thing I want to do, uh, you guys, um, I will definitely be putting a, uh, a link by the way to Phil's YouTube channel, um, as well as his, all his social media stuff and, and the, uh, the, the Porto's work in general, uh, in the show notes. So you can always click that as well and just get there directly. Um, but I, um, I, I reached out on Instagram earlier and just put, and by the way, I got some hilarious responses, but I put <laughs> out like, you know, Hey, I'm about to interview this guy. What should I ask him about? Um, yeah, okay. right, hold on. Let, let me plug in my computer so I don't lose you. Oh, oh, this hold is, on, a- hold on. this is amateur hour right here. You guys. <laughs> to be fair, everybody that's listening to this, you guys, I, I, uh, I, I typically promise that these are going to be, you know, like 15 to 20, maybe 30 minute podcasts. And this one has ran uh, well over an hour. But if you're still here, you just, you just got to the meat of why, like the, the why behind Phil 
uh, his love for community, his love for art, and then, you know, like his story and what he's going through. So if you're still here, I think, uh, I think that yeah, I hope my sincere hope is that this was well worth your time. Um, so Phil's plugging in his computer and I guess we could probably edit this time out, but I don't think we will. Instead, I think knowing Jared, he'll probably leave it in. Um, but I, I am going to, I'm going to rattle you through these things super quick. Uh, Phil, um, the top, the All top, right. the top topics that people wanted us to talk about. Can you still hear me? Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. You're there. Okay. Yeah. You look good yeah. too. You look better Thanks. now. Yeah. Thanks. Way to upgrade it. Okay. Yeah, the, the top topics, um, your awesome tattoos. Thanks. There you go. Hey, by the way, I noticed that you have a Wu-Tang tattoo on your bicep. Way to be awesome there. I think that's probably why Derek actually likes you. Uh, Tom Wright said, building others up. Um, Man, Tom, like pot calling the kettle there, but but that that is absolutely like superpower of yours, man. Uh, Jeff Fett, do you know what Jeff Fett said? His time in the Red Baron and how it's possibly influenced his photography. Wow. So the Red Baron's that band that I quit so I can marry my wife. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, it was a fun time. And uh, yeah, it, I, I, I stepped into the Red Baron, which was a hardcore influence band, but I was born and raised on hip hop. So everything I did story wise came from a hip hop approach. Um, when, when I would write lyrics and everything like that. So I guess that kind of affects all my storytelling as well is like, I grew up on a genre of music that was all about how well you could tell a story, like to paint a picture completely. Um, and so that's what I try to do in photography as well. So that happened in the Red Baron. And now I'm kind of using that as well here. I love it. Okay. Very cool. Uh, David Kovacs, um, said, uh, uh, can't wait to listen. Y'all are two of my favorites. So Dave's, I love that, dude. I, come on, man. Uh, let's see. Um, we had somebody, we already kind of touched on this. Somebody asked about your post-processing look. We kind of touched briefly on the fact that like that, that comes second, which yeah, by the way, hit you, me up in the DMs. Yeah. Just write. Phil will just edit your work for you. That's what I heard. <laughs> um, I'm going to be selling a preset though. So hit me up. Ah, yeah, dude. Okay. I'm actually excited to buy that. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, there were several others in here, but, um, the last shameless plug, James Cunningham wants to know about your love for Fuji and dude, I don't have another hour for you. So (laughs) keep it freaking short, but, but tell us about this, uh, this connection that you have with the Fuji film camera and, and, and why, man. Yeah. Um, so for me, it's all about experience. The first time I used a Fuji camera, it just melted in my hand. Like it just felt right, you know? Um, and, and, and what I love is like, when I buy into something, I want to know that it's worth buying into, you know? Um, like a lot of people get sponsored by everybody here, there, and whatever gear wise, you know, send me these products and I'll review it. Um, I don't really do that. You know, like if I'm going to shout something from the rooftops, it's because it deserves to be shouted from the rooftop. Um, And so everything from my experience using the camera to every person that I've actually built relationship with through the brand, you know, like props to every single person on the repair team that has treated me like gold. Um, Shout out to Stacy. Shout out to um, Victor. you know, like they're, they're just great. Um, Falcone, you know, she's just a boss, you know, like everyone on the team has just treated me so, so well. Every Fuji photographer that I'm friends with, um, are are people that I aspire to continue to be like with and without a camera. Um, and so it's a community that I can shout from the rooftops because I feel like it's kind of like one of those things that you never want to invite people to a restaurant that you've had some good experiences with, but maybe not all the time, you know, or like you've gone once and then like people come and you're like, oh crap, this place actually is crap. Um, But the whole time that I've been part of the Fuji community and building those relationships, 
I've had a great experience. So I easily will shout from the rooftops for other people to come on in because I know that the water's safe. I know that when they come in, they don't have to worry about the sharks, that they're going to actually experience a good time. Yeah, um, zero, so, zero food poisoning at no the Fuji poisoning. Film family. Yeah. So, oh, so yeah, yeah so, so that's it. Hey, uh, here's here's how I want to wrap this up because I I literally just got it and and I'm excited for you to hear this. Okay, so um, I'm gonna sign off right after this. But um, guys, I I just got a message in about Phil Porto from our uh, our our good buddy, the CEO of Holdfast Gear, uh, Matt Swagger. And uh, Matt said, I've I've known Phil for several years now, and every conversation I've ever had with him usually ends up on the topic of purpose and vision. Every single time. When I was made aware of what Phil is going through now, this scripture came to mind because he actually reminds me of this very text. Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be firm, immovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. Phil Porto, for as long as I've known you, with every conversation I've had, you point towards excelling in the work of the Lord in your own life. Understanding purpose and vision is everything. When you have that, there's nothing you can't accomplish. Linking arms with people like this is what I want to do every single day. And Phil is that guy. He's standing firm today. And so am I. Dude, you guys are, uh, whoa, this is a, like, I wish I was this prepared for every episode. But the truth of the matter is this all came together um, because of the guy that we're interviewing today. So, um, y'all, this uh, this has been the, um, <laughs> the Photographic Collective podcast and I don't know if I can ever outdo this episode. So <laughs> this may be a one hit wonder. Um, but guys, my name is Miles Wood Boyer. I'm so grateful that you took the time to, uh, to invest an hour of your life into listening to me just wax poetic with one of my best friends. Phil, thank you so much for taking time out of your day, out of your, your work life, um, out of your story to share, to share it with us, man. Thank you, man. I appreciate it so much. Thank you all for listening.